Welcome everyone to this session called Young Voices and Visions in Tropical Restoration Science. Uh, please make sure that you can enable subtitles in Zoom in case you need it. So the main purpose of this session is to provide a platform for doctoral students advancing the science of restoration and to present their vision for the future of restoration science. In this UN decade of restoration starting this year, there is a critical window of opportunity to mobilize and implement action for a resilient, adaptive, socially just and equitable future, the responsibility of which falls on today's young generation of fantastic researchers doing exceptional work. However, many of us young researchers, especially doctoral students, face many challenges, including lack of opportunities to present their research, lack of funding avenues, lack of the know-how of building effective collaborations, or even knowing other students and lab groups, which have all been exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Hence, we hope this session is not only a knowledge sharing opportunity, but it also fosters a community of young researchers working together to address the big challenges of restoration science. We have a threefold objective for this session. One, present research highlighting novel analysis and our visions of various aspects of restoration science in different tropical ecosystems and contexts. Two, hear from many of the other young restoration scientists about their visions for restoration science, especially from those underrepresented in our panel. And three, synthesize the outcomes of the session to produce a peer-reviewed uh, conference paper about the visions of the future leaders of tropical restoration science. So the agenda for the hour is we will start off by listening to six young researchers, uh, which will be about half an hour. I request all of you to mute yourselves during the presentations. Um, after the presentations, we will provide a link and instructions to finish a quick five minute survey uh, about your visions. And in the remaining amount of time, we will have a live Q&A session. So please use the Q&A option that is at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask us questions. And feel free to have all different interactions during the um, session and also provide your visions in the chat option. So there are two separate options for Q&A and chat. Um, please feel free to turn on your cameras if you have the bandwidth and without much further ado, uh, I guess we can begin. Hello everyone, my name is Tina Christman. I'm a German-Italian PhD student at the University of Oxford. And today I will present um, on my first PhD chapter, which is called A Roadmap for Tropical Mountain Restoration um, and includes the findings of a systematic review that I've been doing the last year. So as many of you might know, tropical mountain ecosystems have very outstanding biodiversity due to different climatic niches, due to, like varying topography um, and a range of ecosystems from montane forests in the lowlands to cloud forests, azonal formations, the tree line, but also different kinds of grassland formations. Um, tropical mountain ecosystems are high in endemism as well, provide um, a plethora of ecosystem services to the lowlands. However, um, they're strongly degraded by different drivers of global change, ranging from agricultural expansion to deforestation, use for livestock and cattle, but also climate change and invasion. So we set out to explore how ecosystems have been degraded are being restored and we did this through a systematic review so we employed a standardized search string related to restoration to tropics and to mountain environments um, and after filtering thousand studies we included 176 studies from four databases into our review and we asked three questions and i'm going to talk you through those briefly and through the main findings the first question is where how and why is restoration research conducted so here we looked at restoration geography. So we looked at where studies are located and how they're varied over time and what ecosystems they cover. And um, on the bo bottom picture of the panel here, um, you can see that there's a very strong Latin America focus of all the studies that we reviewed, with most studies being located either in Mexico or in Costa Rica and a big, big scarcity of studies. 
both in, um, in Africa, but also in Asia. Um, on a positive note, we found um, a steady increase in restoration studies in the last 10 years, but still montane forests are the most studied forests in a mountain restoration context. Of all those studies assessed, we found that most studies were conducted in the short term and on also small scale, <laughs> on the short term and um, on small spatial scales. So most studies were either at the patch scale or a local scale and um, conducted for less than a year. So the findings are short in both scales, essentially. Um, of all the studies we looked at, uh, what stood out is that most of the, the motivations to restore the existence are strongly ecological. Um, so we looked at um, the ecological motivations of restoration in terms of ecosystem services, and we found that um, the recovery support supporting ecosystem services was um, yeah, overrepresented, and this was only followed by um, regulating ecosystem services, which were targeted with restoration interventions, and specifically those were um, restoration interventions in order to promote water regulation and erosion prevention. Um, second, our second question, we looked at what restoration methods and interventions are being used. So we looked at this by different ecosystems. So on the left-hand side of that figure, you see a sort of like schematic elevation gradient and at the bottom, different types of restoration interventions. Um, and what we see is that natural regeneration was the most studied restoration intervention and restoration approach throughout. Um, and this was followed by seedling planting. But obviously there's been a suite of other approaches ranging from herbivore and grazing ex exclusion to soil amendments to also mycorrhizal inoculation. Um, and most of those were quite ecosystem specific. So obviously in the grasslands, we find a different set of restoration interventions than in montane forests. Our third question was what limits and promotes restoration success? Um, and for this, I developed this sort of diverging bar chart to sort of show this. So, um, the process at the bottom are the uh, the factors at the bottom are the limiting factors. So they're displayed with a negative axis. And we find that the main li limiting factor was habitat constraints, which is unsurprising in a harsh mountain environment. Um, but also dispersed limitations related to sort of compromised movement of seed dispersers and competitive interactions with other plants, be it ferns or um, yeah, other invasives or exotics. The top promoting factors, quite analogous to limiting factors, were favorable microsite conditions. So having some sort of restoration intervention that actually really restores a favorable microsite, microsite. And often this was done by using facilitative interactions, um, for instance, by planting pasture trees or um, yeah, planting um, sort of young successional species to sort of facilitate um, further forest recovery. But we also found that site vegetation variables, specifically, um, whether the surrounding area of vegetate, the restoration site had a similar vegetation type, that really strongly um, affected um, restoration success in a positive way. So um, as an uh, as sort of um, advertised for a session, we were gonna talk a bit about our visions for um, our field of restoration. So I'm gonna talk about my visual, vision for tropical mountain restoration. And so far we find this wealth of small scale ecological studies uh, with most research in Latin America, specifically Central America, and many studies in forested ecosystems. And sort of six steps that I would want to see in the next 10 years, and um, that's of course one of my vision, would be to conduct more remote sensing and large scale assessments of mountain restoration. And um, secondly, to study um, the social dimensions of restoration. Third, to make better use of technologies for site detection and monitoring, which was also really underrepresented under in the studies we looked at. Fourth, to really include climate change considerations in restoration assessments in mountains. Fifth, to have a bit of a boom in um, restoration studies on alpine grasslands. And sixth, to um, include a financial dimension as well, to sort of make mountain restoration profitable and viable. Yeah, so I'll be addressing some of these steps in the next years for my PhD. So now um, I can only thank um, some of my collaborators, specifically um, my supervisor, Emma Oliveras, who's a co-author on this paper, and also my funding agency, The Roads Trust. Thanks so much, and do reach out to me um, if you've got any questions. Hi there, everybody. My name is Rebecca Puttick. I'm a first year PhD candidate at Newcastle University, and I'm co-supervised by Professor Yatante and Dr. Marion Pfeiffer. I'm based in the School of Natural and Environmental Sciences, and I work within the Modelling Evidence and Policy Research Group, and also with the Tropical Landscapes Lab. My research is funded by One Planet, which is a NERC funded training program, and I've just popped a QR code on the slides and that will take you to my Linktree profile. So if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can scan that using a smartphone and you'll have details for my Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. So, yeah, please feel free to do that. 
Um, now I'm going to be talking to you briefly today about the importance of restoring connectivity in tropical forest systems, how I'm applying this within my own research, and finally why I believe connectivity is conceptually so important in my own visions for the future of restoration. So firstly, just a little bit of context for the issues I'm going to be talking about. Um, it's been reported that deforestation and forest degradation are the two greatest threats to forests globally, and consequently their exploitation it has a huge range of impacts across different scales for biodiversity, for society and the climate. And if forests suffer from this ongoing conversion and degradation, so too do the species that inhabit these forests, and many tropical species are threatened with extinction, and that is actually accelerating for both plant and animal species. And it's closely linked to these ideas of forest loss and fragmentation. So one solution that's been proposed to remedy this is the restoration of landscape connectivity. So within landscape ecology, this idea of connectivity has been used to conceptualise how the movement or flows of different ecological units are facilitated by their physical surroundings. And so from a functional standpoint, connectivity facilitates the movement of biotic and abiotic resources between patches within a landscape, and that helps to enable ecological functioning. So just as a very simple but important example, um, for instance, seed dispersal by animals is the primary form of dispersal in tropical rainforests, but this process is impeded when animals such as birds or primates, so these species that are commonly dispersing the large seeded tree species, when they're limited by habitat fragmentation. So fundamentally, forest loss and fragmentation pose a real risk to the structure and function of tropical forests overall. And even further to this, connectivity is not only important now to ensure that ecological processes can be carried out by organisms, but will also become increasingly important in the future. And this is important because it will ensure that species can move through their landscapes and shift their range in line with changing climates and so avoid extinction from anthropogenic climate change. So there's also a temporal aspect here as to why connectivity is so important too. And I've just popped this infographic on the screen here that hopefully shows some of the links um, and some of the kind of key aspects of connectivity conceptually. So with this in mind, a key strategy that's emerged for protecting or enhancing connectivity is forest restoration. And as it's rarely possible to restore entire landscapes, it's important to develop strategies that focus upon critical areas of the landscape for restoration. So, for example, these could be areas like wildlife corridors or residual old growth forest patches. And in terms of how this relates to my own research, I'm aiming to develop a restoration strategy for a case study area. Um, and it's a highly fragmented forest and oil palm landscape in central Sarawak, so Malaysian Borneo. And my work will focus primarily on how restoration action could be targeted to improve landscape connectivity for large bodied mammal species that are functionally important in their ecosystems. So the study will introduce a GIS based methodology and design several site scale reforestation options, evaluating them with respect to a set of ecological and socioeconomic criteria. And the prioritisation is based on two main non compensatory factors. And that's the need for biodiversity conservation um, against the need for or the feasibility rather of restoring these areas. So I hope to assess the performance um, against some other metrics as well. So I'll be looking at factors such as cost and climate change mitigation potential. And this sort of scenario analysis and cost benefit analysis is something that's become really important to me as I've developed a working relationship with the industry collaborators for this project. And I've kind of come to realise that there's so, just so many different goals and outcomes that may be desirable in restoration contexts, in addition to practical site specific facets of restoration that need to be considered. And there's just really a lot to consider before jumping into reforesting an area. So my input into this project will mainly come from the ecology perspective, so specifically looking at how large bodied mammals are using the landscape and therefore whether passive or assisted regeneration strategies could be feasible. And that'll be based primarily on how intact the faunal community is throughout my study landscape. Now, I appreciate that was a slight whistle stop tour of my research. Um, if anybody has any more specific questions about the methodologies or the concepts, um, then please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, so I'm just going to round off by discussing my vision for restoration. And I'd like to do this by just sharing these photos with you. And these have been taken um, over the last 12 months or so, uh, mainly in the northeast of England, near Newcastle, where I'm currently living. And I'd say it's quite an accurate summary of how I've spent a lot of my time during lockdown um, throughout the COVID pandemic. And looking back at these photos, it's really kind of concreted in my own mind how much I actually rely on nature and natural spaces to keep both mentally and physically well. And I'm sure I'm not alone in that. And thinking about connectivity and being connected with nature, it's really hard to stay away from kind of cliches. Um, but I do feel so lucky to have quite a holistic um, perspective on natural systems and processes. 
And I feel like for restoration, this understanding of how interconnected people are with the planet is so important. Um, and perhaps at an individual level, people feel a great sense of stewardship and connection to nature. And that's not just within their immediate environment, but the environment at a more global scale. Then perhaps this awareness and appreciation can lead to collective action to tackle huge global issues like biodiversity loss, climate change, the need for restoration, all of these issues. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that comes from reconnecting people with nature. And it's something that I've had the privilege of doing over the past year. And it's been really intrinsic to me coping with starting a PhD during um, these really strange times. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks again to my supervisors, Yit and Marion. And thank you to Tina and Tricia for organising this open format session and giving me the platform to share my work and vision with you all. Hello, my name is Michael Pashkovich and I'm at the University of Cambridge. And today I'll be talking about my research on restoring tropical agriculture. Whenever we talk about restoring agriculture, I think it's important for us to acknowledge two fairly obvious points. The first of these is that we need agriculture for food and livelihoods, so agriculture is here to stay. The second is that the expansion and intensification of agriculture has led to large declines in biodiversity and changes in functioning worldwide. And therefore, we need to improve our management of agricultural systems in order to make it more sustainable. Restoring agriculture could help halt and reverse these negative trends and make overall agricultural production more sustainable. We need restoration within agriculture worldwide, but it could be particularly valuable for us to focus on the tropics. And this is for a few reasons. First of all, tropical landscapes have fast and a high rate of completion for recovery after disturbance. Second, the tropics have large areas of natural habitat remaining, and the preservation of this natural habitat could accelerate the recovery of degraded habitat, for instance, by spillover of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Third, agricultural production has intensified only relatively recently in many areas of the tropics, and therefore it could be easier for us to revert from chemical dependent so-called green revolution approaches to agricultural management towards more ecologically friendly approaches to agricultural production. And lastly, the tropics are home to many restoration hotspots, and I'm using this definition from Bernardo Strasberg and colleagues' 2020 Nature paper, which defined a restoration hotspot as an area where the socio-environmental benefits derived from restoring certain areas are particularly large relative to the costs of implementing restoration action. So for all of these reasons, I'm arguing that it's an important thing for us to focus on restoring tropical agricultural systems. And yet, despite this potential, there is a lack of understanding of how to practically restore tropical agricultural systems in a way that can be done by farmers across the tropics. But to show one way in which we're trying to find how to improve our understanding of how to do this, I want to focus on some research occurring in oil palm. If you're not familiar with oil palm, it's a crop that's grown across the tropics and it produces palm oil, which is the most traded vegetable oil worldwide. This is very reminiscent of a typical oil palm plantation. And the growth of oil palm has led to transformation of natural habitats and therefore restoration action within oil palm could help provide a win-win solution to both production as well as conservation. I'm part of a program called the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Function in Tropical Agriculture or BEFTA program, where a collaboration between academics and members of the palm oil industry and we're testing how different restoration management strategies can affect the structural complexity, ecology, and productivity of oil palm systems. To do this, we're currently operating two ongoing restoration projects in industrial oil palm plantations in Riau, Sumatra, Indonesia. The first of these experiments is an understory vegetation project in which we're manipulating the amount of herbicide applied to oil palm plantations to determine how changes in structural complexity of understory vegetation can translate into wider changes in the oil palm system. We're also operating a riparian restoration experiment in which we're testing strategies for restoring areas of land alongside waterways and oil palm plantations. I just wanna briefly outline some of the findings of our project so far. So in the understory vegetation project, We've shown that maintaining understory vegetation can benefit the biodiversity of a wide range of taxa, including plants, arthropods, soil fauna, and vertebrates such as leopard cats, as well as the ecosystem functions that these groups provide. And although our Verita project is only a couple of years old, we've shown that maintaining riparian buffers can benefit the biodiversity of a range of different arthropod taxa. 
Moving forward, we'll continue assessing the effects of our restoration treatment on a wider variety of different taxonomic groups and their ecosystem functions, and also link our ecological findings to those focused on oil palm yields and profitability, therefore providing a very comprehensive picture of how restoration could affect these human and natural tropical systems. In this last minute of my talk, I just want to talk about my vision then for restoration moving forward. If the literature tells us anything, it's that the success of restoration actions is improved when we answer key questions relating to who should be involved in and benefit restoration and where, what, and how restoration should occur. And so I hope to see increased investment of time, energy, and capital in order to address the who, where, what, and how of restoring tropical agriculture. This is going to require more experiments that test the efficacy of individual restoration strategies. These experiments need to occur across spatial and temporal scales. And ideally what they'll do is that they'll identify restoration methodologies that yield large socio-environmental benefits at low costs. Underpinning both of these first two items is going to be increased collaboration between stakeholders and when we're talking about restoring tropical agriculture, it's really important for us to focus particularly on three stakeholders, I think, which is academia, agricultural industries, and also members of local communities, in order to ensure that the benefits of restoring tropical agriculture are widely dispersed and that it's done in a fair and just way. Thank you so much for listening to this talk. If you'd like to find more about the restoration work we're doing in Oil Palm, feel free to follow me at MD Pashkovich or to follow at BEFTA program. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Trisha Gopalakrishna, and I'm one of the co-organizers of this session, so welcome. I am a second year DPhil candidate at the School of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford, and my doctorate research looks at the opportunities and realities of ecosystem restoration in India. Today, I will provide a glimpse of my findings about the potential of forest restoration for climate change mitigation, and my vision for tropical restoration science. At the bottom of each slide, there's a QR code with all my social channels. So please feel free to scan and get in touch with me to talk about research. Global studies highlight the area of opportunity for forest restoration and the mitigation potential shown in the bar plot. Uh, these global studies are valuable because they highlight broad scale patterns driven by global scale processes. However, they are limited in their ability to account for locally specific information in regions or countries that can easily deviate from the global estimates. Various countries have made national and international pledges to restore forests to limit rising temperatures. India is one such country that has ambitious goals as part of its NDC to the Paris Agreement. However, there has been limited assessment of the feasibility of these targets and which regions within India are most appropriate to expand forest and tree cover, which is the main motivation of this study. Here, we took advantage of a rich variety of India-specific data sets, which are listed in the next slide. We first modeled the biophysical envelope of the presence of forest using over 10,000 GPS points of different forest types across all 28 states and six out of eight union territories, which I refer to as jurisdiction, um, using a list of uh, a variety of environmental predictors as shown on the slide in a machine learning framework, we predicted the probability of the presence of forests based on biophysical conditions alone. The result is 101 million hectares of where forests could be present, from which various land uses and land covers that cannot be restored were sequentially excluded. Ultimately, we estimated that there is about 1.6 million hectares of opportune land available for forest restoration in India and 14.67 million hectares of opportune land for agroforestry available in India, which is additional to what is currently present. We completed a verification of the 1.6 million hectares um, by using a fine resolution India specific land use land cover map and then visually analyzed over 500 random points within each of the LULC classes that characterize the opportunity. We estimated that the majority of the 1.6 million hectares of opportune land is classified as degraded forest, scrub, 
or barren with mixed current land uses and land covers, examples of which are shown on the slide. The Central Indian states have the highest total opportunity of half a million hectares, with Chhattisgarh having the highest uh, area of opportunity for forest restoration, while the Western Indian states have the least area of opportunity. Delhi and Tripura have no opportunity remaining after exclusion of LULCs that cannot be restored. We used forest inventory data for all carbon pools except soil for different forest types in different biogeographic zones in each jurisdiction uh, to calculate the cumulative carbon stocks that could naturally regenerate in the area of opportunity of 1.6 million hectares. We estimated a total of 61.2 teragrams of carbon with the top five states with the highest mitigation potential shown in the map. We completed a literature review to assign sequestration rates of agri-silvicultural systems in India to determine the mitigation potential of agroforestry. This is at a coarse national scale and not broken down by state. Our estimates of opportunity for forest restoration and agroforestry is consistently lower than other studies as shown in the bar plot because our study accounts for the fine scale and detailed variation in land uses and land covers across India that cannot be restored. Also, we highlight that the potential of agroforestry and forest restoration is only a maximum of 24% of India's pledge to the Paris Agreement. We recommend a regional and state-specific analysis of uh, forest restoration and agroforestry moving ahead across many different countries in the tropical biome. My vision for the next 10 years of restoration science is uh, simple and important. I would like to learn about restoration science from different parts of the world uh, to truly represent the pioneering research that is taking place across the tropical biome. I would like to learn about restoration science across diverse ecosystems, including open ecosystems and uh, uh, wetlands, to name a few. Tropical restoration science in the new decade will benefit greatly by interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary studies, which I'm ho uh, hoping to uh, read and learn about. And I envision restoration science in the tropics to be an integrative approach, looking at multiple ecosystem services and not just focusing on one or two, uh, which helps in paving the way to thinking about uh, mitigation and adaptive and resilient societies. Lastly, I envision restoration science in the tropics to include diverse voices, uh, focusing on representation across race, gender, age group, and expertise, just to name a few criteria, uh, when thinking about funding big projects with um, teams of many scientists, or when thinking about boards or councils or trustees of big initiatives, or also in panel discussions in such conferences. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session and the rest of the conference. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Wiegand and over the past years I've studied how high-level landscape restoration targets are implemented locally in Ecuador and Ethiopia. My research departs from the idea that while it is national governments that committed to concrete restoration targets, it is uh, the local governments that are in the front line to implement these targets. And while the global landscape restoration momentum continues to grow, it remains largely unexplored how national targets are achieved locally. In my project, I therefore focused on the challenges that emerge in the governance process when governments implement restoration efforts. In my research, I distinguished the governance and ecological skills. In restoration governance, there is firstly cross-skill interaction when actors on the governance skill aim to influence relevant processes on the ecological skill through natural regeneration or reforestation. Secondly, there is cross-level interaction when governance actors at different levels coordinate with each other to implement restoration policies. The governance and ecological skills both have a spatial and a temporal dimension. We use these cross-skill and cross-level interactions as a lens to observe so-called skill challenges that can emerge between skills and levels. Two types of skill challenges are listed here. The first relates to a blind spot 
uh, governance actor may have when failing to recognize important skill or level interactions when implementing a policy. The second relates to persistent mismatches between skills or between levels. We studied a total of four case study landscapes to obtain a thick description of how national restoration targets are implemented locally. In Ecuador, we focused on the implementation of the National Forest Restoration Plan, while in Ethiopia, we studied two government-led restoration mechanisms, participatory forest management and area enclosure. We followed an exploratory case study design through which we conducted interviews at national, regional, district, and community level. In this way, we captured the perception of actors who are part of the landscape restoration community of practice, from high-level civil servants down to local government staff and natural resource user group members. Through these steps, we identified a total of five skill challenges in each country, while a few challenges were similar in Ecuador and Ethiopia, others were unique to one country. For example, in both countries, we observed that short-term governance efforts mismatch long-term restoration processes. In Ecuador, short-term election cycles pushed politicians to generate quick successes and bias them towards highly visible restoration methods like tree planting. It proved harder to convince politicians about the benefits of less visible natural regeneration, despite it sometimes being more suitable and doing more justice to tree biodiversity. The Ethiopian context was characterized by annual tree planting quota. Here, the government focused on organizing highly visible tree planting campaigns. However, without much attention being paid to proper planting preparation or post-planting management to ensure uh, tree seedling survival. Also in Ethiopia, we observed that the restoration efforts of the government and international development partners uh, allocated insufficient budget for alternative local livelihoods to sustain restoration processes on the long term. Uh, restoration projects mostly focused on placing more forests under restoration in spite of clear signals that the benefits that communities get from non-timber forest products are still insufficient to compensate for lost income opportunities. In Ecuador, we observed that parish governments, uh, being the most decentralized government level in the country, received most restoration funds from the national government, while being inexperienced with doing restoration work. Meanwhile, uh, already existing restoration efforts and actors in the studied landscapes hardly received any funding from the national level, nor were they involved in the national plan. So how can these observations contribute to a better future of ecosystem restoration in the tropics? Well, I envision a future in which much greater attention is placed on understanding how national and subnational governments are implementing landscape restoration targets, uh, with governments at multiple levels being increasingly required to do their share in fulfilling national targets, uh, I think it's needed to understand the actual dynamics that are linked to implementing the targets. And being aware of the challenges that are currently faced in restoration governance allows us to learn from the past and inform and incrementally improve ongoing and future restoration processes. Well, that's it for me. Uh, many thanks for your attention, and I look forward to being in contact with you in case you have any questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my presentation as part of Young Voices and Visions in Restoration. My talk will be on investigating the use of liana cutting as a tool for rainforest restoration, which is part of my PhD at the University of Sunshine Coast here in Australia. It's also part of the wider Forest Restoration and Climate, or FORCE experiment, which aims to measure long-term tropical forest dynamics and recovery. So, firstly, as I'm sure many of you already know, lianas are woody vines that are rooted to the ground but use trees for support to climb and access the canopy. 
This introduces mechanical stress and competition with trees for resources, but they are a natural part of rainforest ecosystems, contributing towards biomass and stem density. Most of the literature shows lianas negatively impact tree growth, increase mortality and decrease trees' ability to store carbon. They may also delay or stall succession through creating a positive feedback loop with disturbance. So conditions associated with disturbance, like increased light levels and dryness, tend to favour the growth of lianas over trees. This then limits the tree growth, preventing them growing up and the canopy closing, thereby maintaining those disturbed open canopy conditions, leading to further liana proliferation. Therefore, liana removal may have potential use as a forest restoration tool. Almost all previous liana cutting experiments do demonstrate that liana cutting benefits trees, but these have a neotropical bias and there is a lack of data available on the impact that this may have on the rest of the ecosystem, i.e. on metrics beyond tree growth. Furthermore, these studies have simply compared cut versus non-cut. So caution must be taken. Widespread liana cutting may have unforeseen adverse effects on the rainforest ecosystem, as they do have a positive influence. For example, their high leaf turnover contributes to nutrient cycling and distribution, which helps sustain invertebrate communities. They provide food and movement pathways for key animal species. It's also thought they may actually provide a bandage effect, so protecting the trees, for example, from strong winds and herbivory. There's also some evidence that although lianas do peak in abundance following disturbance, they decrease in abundance as succession occurs. So maybe liana proliferation is just a natural part of the successional process and we don't need to interfere. So overall, lianas have both positive and negative effects on rainforest ecosystems. So it's not yet clear whether cutting would be helpful or detrimental to restoration. We also cannot assume this would be consistent across the tropics. It has been hypothesised that up to a certain tipping point in abundance, lianas play a positive role and hence assist restoration. But beyond this, they proliferate excessively in a positive feedback loop, negatively influencing restoration. So put simply, would cutting some lianas, but not all of them, be the solution? My PhD aims to test this in the wet tropics of North Queensland. Here, a combination of cyclone damage and human disturbance since European settlement has resulted in many vine-dominated patches of forest with few trees, and this is becoming an increasing problem. Councils, national parks and landowners are interested in the application of liana cutting to restore the forest, but want to ensure this won't have any indirect negative effects. Some species here rely on lianas as a food source. For example, the iconic Cairns birdwing butterfly caterpillar feeds on the species of vine and it's thought that coverage of saplings by lianas could actually protect them from cyclones in the early stages of growth. Because the area hosts so many endemic species and there have been no liana cutting trials here before, we don't yet know the impact cutting would have on these species, so further research is needed. So for my study, we're setting up vegetation plots to measure trees and lianas, as well as other measures of forest health, including leaf area index, species diversity, and microclimate. When we have finished collecting these measures, we will experimentally manipulate liana biomass through cutting and model this against these measures of forest health to identify whether this tipping point exists. This should inform the use of liana cutting as a forest restoration practice here in North Queensland, providing guidelines of how many should be cut, if any, to ensure a healthy forest, thereby facilitating restoration. This should help restore and maintain this highly biodiverse, unique world heritage region for future generations. Which brings us to my vision. My vision of the future of forest restoration is that which is not just focused on tree growth and carbon sequestration, although this is extremely important, but on restoration of the ecosystem as a whole. Attempting to fast forward the recovery process with human intervention, for example, liana cutting, may not always be the best option. Rainforests are highly complex biodiverse ecosystems and fast forwarding may bypass key processes that must occur during succession in order to produce a fully functional healthy ecosystem with its maximum biodiversity. Furthermore, each region is unique with differing geography, land use history and species. So restoration methods should be thoroughly researched in the target area before use 
as what works in one rainforest may not necessarily work in another. So that's all. Thank you so much for listening and giving me the opportunity to present. Thanks everyone for your talks. Um, I invite the panelists to turn their cameras back on. So we've seen a plethora of different kinds of restoration research conducted by young researchers, spanning from research on conservation governance, restoration governance, to agroforestry, to remote sensing. Um, and we've also heard about everyone's visions and we've seen there's some common themes, but also some very um, different visions in what we want to see as young researchers for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. So now we'd like to hear about the vision that you as the audience have so for this, we've created a little survey where you can contribute your vision. Um, it's a Google form with six or seven questions around who you are, what career stage you're in, but also um, with, a one, with a question around a one, one sentence statement for your restoration vision and what you think are the next steps that need to be addressed. So Trisha is posting the, chat, uh, the link in the chat, so you can just access it there, or you can um, also scan the QR code on this. So the survey will be open for a while, so you can either use the opportunity now while we're doing the Q&A to fill it out, or you also have the rest of the day and then we probably close it by tonight or tomorrow. And this will then be a chance for everyone to like, contribute um, to the, sort of the data collection for this little conference paper that we're doing. And if anyone else wants to be involved, please send us a message as well. And Trisha and I are, and all the others here are always happy to um, get other people on board to contribute to this like interactive um, feature that we want to have. Um, so now, we're running a little Q&A session with some of the questions that have been left unanswered in the chat. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So there are a few questions to Trisha and a few questions to Michael. Let's start with Michael. Michael, is there a risk that maintaining understory flora in oil palm plantations may facilitate the spread of invasive species? This is a question answered. Um, this is a question, um, question by Sean. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, thank you for this question and for listening to the talk. Um, so, I mean, it, the short answer is that there is in some ways. Um, there's uh, a risk that uh, intervening in the ecosystem could kind of promote the biodiversity of um, invasive species. And this is something that we're monitoring as part um, of the experiments. And so I should note both of our experiments that are occurring in the BEFTA program, um, they're both following highly robust before after control impact designs. So we can not only monitor what sort of the ecosystem was like before the implementation of our treatment, but then also through multiple rounds of post-treatment data collection, be able to assist how changes in the ecosystem are occurring over time. And um, so far in our uh, understory vegetation project, um, we haven't found any indication that it's leading to um, increased abundances um, of sort of harmful invasive species. And if anything, we found some evidence to, um, to, the, uh, to the other side of that story. Um, so for instance, um, Millie Hood um, in a 2019 paper showed that actually the understory vegetation treatments, they weren't affecting um, the biodiversity of rat populations at all, um, which is a, a huge uh, pest in oil palm plantation. Rats go ahead and they eat the oil palm fruits. Um, and we've also found evidence that um, sort of maintaining more complex understory vegetation communities can increase the biodiversity of important invertebrate predators, such as spiders, um, which then can eat pests that could damage the oil palm crop as well. And so uh, it's, it's all of that to say, it's definitely something that um, could be possible, but um, it's something that we're monitoring. It's of course, if that was the case, it wouldn't be something that would be desirable by any means, um, because ultimately we were looking for these win-win solutions for both conservation and production. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. It's a very elaborate answer to the question. And um, the next question goes to Trisha and it's asked by an anonymous attendee. Trisha, great talk. Do you have carbon loss estimates um, for example, from decomposition or respiration measurements, which you could use to temper the carbon sequestration estimates. Carbon loss is frequently not included in these potential sequestration, cal sequestration calculations, but could be significant given that loss processes offset GPP. Um, very good question and very good point made. Yes, it is pretty important. Unfortunately, I do not have decomposition or respiration measurements. Uh, if you do, then please do get in touch with me because that would add a lot and it would probably change the calculations quite a bit. And uh, yeah, it's just I couldn't include it because I could not find data by different forest types, by different biogeographic uh, zones in India. So yeah, 
please do get in touch with me. It would be great to work on it. Thanks, Trisha. Um, I've got a question for Becca now. It's been a bit of a thread that's been going on around what exactly are going to be your methods for your PhD research. Maybe you can briefly elaborate on that and then also answer Sean's question around how you're going to create the habitat suitability maps for your research. Uh, yeah, so I, I answered briefly in the um, in the chat, but just to kind of reiterate what I've already said there. Um, so I'll be using existing data sets and looking at factors in the landscape, things like distance to roads or land use type, and using that to create a general kind of habitat suitability map. Um, and then that will become the base layer of the connectivity modeling. So using habitat suitability as a proxy um, for kind of the likelihood of movement or resistance value um, for animals moving through that landscape. Um, so there's a few data sets that I have for that um, that are, um, fortunately I've been able to use from other researchers in my research group um, here at Newcastle University. So I'll be taking that first of all. And then also I'll be using that data to design my sampling design in the landscape. Um, to try and sample as many different habitat types and kind of habitat species associations as possible within the kind of oil palm forest landscapes. And then that will also be integrated at some point in the models. But this is very early stages. I have a, a lot to learn with it. But yeah, excited to start. Thanks for, thanks for the answer. Um, so also just like to reiterate, please fill out the survey, share your vision with us. And also you can use the community board um, on the WUFA website as well to just share your vision and like let us know what you think about the emerging field and like how young people should be involved. Um, I've got two more questions, um, one for Daniel and one for Emma. So Daniel, in your field of governance, what do you think of restoration governance? What do you think are the main challenges and opportunities to really implement effective restoration science and also action? And how, may, how, how can we as scientists maybe in the next few years start addressing them? What's the sort of the little bit that you want to contribute to that? Yeah. I have to add to that. Sorry, Daniel. I want to know also if uh, uh, those challenges vary by uh, regions, like when compared, is there a variation across the tropics? Uh, if these challenges are different, because you work, your research, at least what you presented today is Ecuador and Ethiopia, which are very different contextually. Um, so I would, yeah, uh, these challenges, do they vary by region? Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for the questions. Uh, and indeed, um, yeah, the, my research showed that uh, you both have uh, quite similar challenges, uh, but also challenges that are very unique to a country. And um, I think uh, one of the takeaway messages is that, um, uh, yeah, policy responses that are generally top down or bottom up. Uh, they are too crude to bring about uh, forest and landscape restoration that is both successful and at the scale needed. Um, and I really like um, uh, something that was also noted by uh, Pedro uh, Brancaleon and Manuel uh, uh, Guariguata, um, that uh, yeah, the main challenge is actually to find the right mix of commands and control uh, where you implement policies uh, across the whole territory um, uh, and governance, um, uh, where you also include like non-state act actors and more regulatory uh, flexibility and to really negotiate uh, restoration visions that link to local realities um, and, and priorities and, and concerns. Um, uh, and yeah, in, in what I observed in Ecuador is this yeah, complete exclusion of restoration actors that uh, were already working for over a decade uh, on creating ecological corridors, on protecting uh, water sources. Um, and they didn't, uh, yeah, they were not involved in restoration policies while uh, uh, practically all the funding was going to um, uh, yeah, local government actors that did not have uh, any experience with restoration. So if, uh, and, and what is promising to see had this incremental improvement in policies that uh, right now in Ecuador, they're starting with mesas territoriales, and so uh, territorial round tables where not only uh, government actors are, are uh, placed, but also uh, restoration actors who, who have all the experience to really start negotiating landscape level uh, restoration plans. Um, hopefully that's a, a bit of an answer. Yeah. Another very elaborate answer. And um, one last question goes to Emma. 
So Emma, obviously you're presenting a very different restoration for the methods to the standard thing that we hear about. So in your case, it's about like removing a forest component. So how do you think, can, like how can we get that into like the public discourse and how can we like justify it and like communicate it to people that maybe in order to restore a tropical forest, we have to take out a critical component of it. What are your ideas? What can we do as scientists and what are your next steps? Oh gosh, well, I guess like part of the point of the study is we don't know whether we should remove all of them or not. Like I think up here, um, the locals and the national parks and stuff do view Liana as, as a negative thing because when you just like look at rainforest from the side of the road, you can just see it covered in the lianas because of the forest edge effect. So I don't know if it would necessarily be completely promoting their removal until we know for sure whether they are having a negative or positive effect or not. But then if we do know that uh, or we'll find out that they are having a negative effect on forest growth, then I think it'd be like liaising with the national, like the Queensland National Parks Department here and the local councils and just sending out the practitioners and like conducting management to go out and cut the lianas. It'd be exciting to see what the that would be. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, think, I'm very intrigued. Yeah. Yeah. I think we wrap up our session. I just quickly put on the last slide because I'd like to advertise um, a few more opportunities. Um, so we have launched a um, special feature in restoration ecology where we want to sort of like amplify PhD voices in the same way we've been trying to do in this session. So it's a special feature on young voices for restoration in the UN decade of restoration, and that can include tropical but also non-tropical research. So that special feature will be running the next two years until the end of 2022. And we're calling for different sorts of articles. We're calling for perspective pieces to sort of address like the burning questions in um, restoration ecology, and but also for original research. And the condition for that is that you need to be an early career researcher, either a PhD student or a graduate student, or within two years of your PhD. So do feel free um, to send us questions if you have any and related to this special feature, Trisha and I are the guest editors for that, and we're happy to answer any questions. Um, and we'd be really delighted to see some tropical papers in there as well. And other than that, do join the community board discussion that we have on MUVA. Send in any opportunities or ideas that you have, um, and use it as a forum to exchange with other PhD students, maybe to make connections. And yeah, if you've got any more questions, reach out to any of us. I think we'll all be active on that forum. And yeah, it was an, it was an honor to like, to lead the session and to organize this and to like hear from all of you. And I think I'd leave it there. Any of the other panelists want to add something? Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. And there's still a whole day to fill out the survey if you want to contribute. We'll also repost it in, in the community boards and it will be nice to like hear from all of you what you're thinking. Thanks everyone. Thanks all. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.